everyone is in favor of human rights. Uh, human rights in many ways uh, parallel uh, motherhood, uh, apple pie and the flag. Uh, no matter where you go in the world, you will find that uh, the political leaders in power, uh, including some of the very worst dictators, are nevertheless in favor of human rights. Uh, human rights, as my head of school in England uh, remarks, is a sexy subject. It's a subject which uh, immediately elicits interest, and everyone presumably favors human rights. And yet, and yet, <clears throat> a decade ago, René Clément, uh, the uh, famed French uh, film producer, uh, did a movie entitled Les uns et les autres. Les uns et les autres, some others. And he took uh, this title from the French translation of George Orwell's Animal Farm. All the animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And the point of the film was that in reality, in practice, uh, though everyone favors human rights, they favor human rights in their own terms. That is to say, human rights are employed as a device very often to justify what one's own nation is doing, uh, to ensure that one's own nation receives favorable treatment, but uh, other nations are not looked at in the same light. The most important question in the area of human rights is certainly how rights can be justified. Uh, as I mentioned earlier today, my dear friend Professor Rosenblatt of the Concordia University uh, here in California, just to the south of here, uh, has remarked on occasion that he has a right to a Rolls Royce. Very often in the field of human rights there is a confusion between rights on the one hand and wants and needs on the other. The fact that one wants something the fact that one's life would be immensely better were one to have something, uh, the fact that one genuinely needs something, do those matters equate with a right to have such? Professor Rosenblatt is, is deeply troubled by the fact that his students often drive automobiles that are in much better condition and much more recent than his own. Does that fact constitute a justification for the professor having a car of a certain status while the student has a car of another status. How do you define rights? And after you've defined them, how do you justify them? That's what we're going to be dealing with tonight. And in order to do this, uh, we want to take you on a little uh, journey back in time. Anyway, we take you on a uh, visit uh, to the 19th century. <clears throat> we jump into an H.G. Wellesian time machine uh, or uh, a Michael uh, Crichton uh, multi-universe uh, travel uh, device and we rush back into the 19th century. In the 19th century, the prevailing legal philosophy of the West was replaced by another legal philosophy. Uh, for some 1,500 years, the prevailing legal philosophy in the West was a philosophy uh, known as um, legal naturalism, or natural law theory, or juris naturalism. That philosophy held that uh, there is a higher or deeper standard outside of the law on the basis of which the law needs to be judged. And when the positive law sets forth a particular uh, statute uh, or a particular uh, series of case decisions, nonetheless, it is necessary to judge all of that from the outside by a higher ethical or moral standard. In the middle of the 19th century, that legal philosophy was replaced very largely in the West by a philosophy known as legal positivism or legal realism. There's a slight difference between the two, we won't worry about it. In general, that philosophy came to prevail in legal instruction in the common law world, England and America, and also in the civil law world, the European continent. 
According to that legal philosophy of legal positivism, law is simply the command of the sovereign. Law is the command of the sovereign. Uh, it uh, is not to be judged by any standard outside of itself. It is impossible for such standards to operate within the law per se, and one must go to the positive law, to the law of the land, in order to find out what the law is. If it looks like law, tastes like law, and smells like law, it's law, and you don't ask uh, subsequent ethical questions in regard to it. Or if you are asking such questions, you're not asking them within the area of law at all. Now, this philosophy um, was developed by two English uh, scholars. Uh, one of them you would have heard of, certainly, Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian philosopher. Uh, the other, John Austin, whose work was solely within the area of jurisprudence, and he died quite young. Uh, it was thought <coughs> prior to uh, 20 years ago uh, that uh, the originality of this position came largely from Austin. Uh, but in point of fact, Austin borrowed ideas relating to this from Bentham. Uh, the problem was that Bentham had diarrhea of the pen. He could not stop writing. He wrote a great deal, and most of it was not published during his own lifetime. Most of it remained in manuscript. A lot of this material circulated, and uh, some of it influenced Austin. And after Austin's death, his, his widow uh, published his lectures on jurisprudence, so those came out ahead of uh, Jeremy Bentham's work in the same area. Uh, Bentham was, as we have mentioned, a utilitarian. He had various ideas on social improvement, uh, ideas that influenced the law, penal reform, and the like. Uh, one of his ideas, <coughs> just parenthetically, was that it would be useful, utilitarian, utilitarian that he was, it would be useful if great men were not buried. It would be better for them to be embalmed and set up in public places as models for the next generation. Uh, fortunately, <coughs> this idea was not carried out, except in the case of Bentham himself. <laughs> if you would like to see Bentham, you can see him. He is stuffed in University College London. Uh, and uh, the, the embalming was not entirely successful, as a matter of fact. The original skull is between his legs, uh, and the head is, is wax. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, this is quite something to see, and we understand that he is rolled out for certain board meetings at the University of London. Uh, his vote is not known, but that's true of the other members of the board as well. Anyway, the fundamental philosophy of the law set forth by these gentlemen is that once you have identified the political system in operation, and you've determined how law is made within that particular culture, whatever it happens to be, once those procedures are carried out, you cannot raise higher issues as to the legitimacy of the whole thing. The thing is legitimate by virtue of the fact that it follows from the commands of the sovereign. This doesn't require a monarchical system or an autocratic system at all. If you have, for example, a constitutional democracy and those procedures are employed and you end up with a certain law, then that law is law, period. This, of course, means as a philosophy that there will be different legal systems with contradictory laws as compared with other systems, uh, and there is no ultimate way to resolve this. Because though you can criticize the laws within a system as to their consistency, you cannot criticize the system per se. The system stands beyond that. And this carries us to the two most influential representatives of this position in our century, in the 20th century. Uh, namely, H. L. A. Hart at Oxford, professor of jurisprudence at Oxford, he died just a few years ago, and Hans Kelsen, Kelsen who uh, was an Austrian and uh, got to the, to the United States, uh, fortunately, uh, before he could be persecuted under the Hitler regime, spent his last years here in California. He taught at the University of California uh, uh, at Los Angeles and also uh, in, in the north, in the San Francisco area. Uh, these 
two gentlemen refined legal positivism. Uh, and uh, their positions, we can't go into here, it would be carrying us too far afield, but their positions, in spite of the refinements presented, are nonetheless classical positivism. They will not allow the law to be judged by an extrinsic ethic. Uh, let me read you a fairly dense paragraph from H. L. A. Hart, and then I will translate from English into English. <laughs> we only need the word validity, and commonly only use it, to answer questions which arise within a system of rules, where the status of a rule as a member of the system depends on its satisfying certain criteria provided by a rule of recognition. The rule of recognition is the rule by which you determine whether stuff should go into the system or not. Hmm? That will be a fundamental constitutional principle within a legal system. No such question can arise, says Kelson, as to the at heart, uh, as to the validity of the very rule of recognition which provides the criteria. It can neither be valid nor invalid, but is simply accepted as appropriate for use in this way. He uses the analogy of the meter bar in Paris. Let's say that you participate in our two-week program in uh, apologetics uh, and human rights in Strasbourg, France. You're in Strasbourg, France during the summer, and you go into a cancalleri, uh, into a hardware store, uh, and you buy a meter stick. Hmm? Buy a meter stick. But you suspect the owner of the hardware store. Is he perhaps selling meter sticks that are not accurate? So you get on the, uh, the rapide, you get on the, the train from Strasbourg to Paris, clutching your meter stick in your hand, and you go to the Bureau of Standards. And there in a case is a standard meter bar. Now, you can go up to that case and compare the length of your meter stick with the meter bar, the standard meter bar. Hmm? But suppose the thought occurs to you, how do I know that the standard meter bar is the right length? And so you say to the guard there, uh, 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 is the meter bar the right length? And he says, talk, talk, talk. Ils sont fous, les Américains. Uh, Americans are nuts. You can't ask that question. The meter bar is an arbitrary measure. You can compare other meter sticks with it, but you can't meaningfully ask the question as to whether the meter bar is the right length. Says Hart, that's the way it is in legal systems. Hmm? You can determine whether the individual elements in the system properly fit the system, but you can't ask whether the total legal system is valid or invalid, right or wrong, genuine or not. That kind of a question can't be answered. Thus, H.L.A. Hart is indeed a legal positivist. Hans Kelsen in an unpublished lecture that he gave at the University of California at Los Angeles, a lecture which was recorded, uh, he says this, it is of the greatest importance to be aware of the fact that there is not only one moral or political system, but at different times and within different societies, several different moral and political systems are considered to be valid by those living under these normative systems. The systems come into existence by custom, or by the commands of outstanding personalities like Moses, Jesus, or Muhammad. If men believe that these personalities are inspired by a transcendental supernatural, that is a divine authority, the moral or political system has a religious character. It is especially in this case when the moral or political system is supposed to be of divine origin that the values constituted by it are considered to be absolute. However, if the fact is taken into consideration that there are, there were, and probably always will be, several different moral and political systems actually presupposed to be valid within different societies, the values constituted by these systems can be considered to be only relative. Then the judgment that a definite government or a definite legal order is just can be pronounced only with reference to one of the several different political and moral systems, and then the same behavior or the same governmental activity, or the same legal order, may with reference to another moral or political system be considered as morally bad or politically unjust." Unquote. What he's saying is that if you take total legal systems, they are like trains passing in the night. There is no vantage point 
on the basis of which you can judge them except from the standpoint of another system. And if system A makes nasty statements about the immorality of system B, they don't mean anything because system B can turn around and make nasty statements about system A. The systems stand by themselves. You can tinker with the systems internally, but what you cannot meaningfully do is to criticize the systems per se. Law is the commands of the sovereign. Now, uh, this did not worry 19th century thinkers at all. It particularly didn't worry the English. Why? Because <clears throat> the 19th century was the great century of English imperial expansion, and it was a conviction, a firm conviction, an unquestioned position of those in England during the Victorian period that eventually the world would become English. And of course, under those conditions, differing legal systems wouldn't make any, uh, any significant difference because ultimately everything would be uh, Englished. Englished. Um, as I say to my, my friends in England, uh, <clears throat> uh, this was based upon a fairly basic misconception. Do you know, for example, why the sun never set on the British Empire? The reason is that God doesn't trust an Englishman in the dark. <laughs> the end result uh, of <laughs> the expansion of uh, the empire in the 19th century was, of course, the disintegration of that empire early in the 20th century. And in our century, uh, what has been the uh, general situation? Well, uh, we have managed two perfectly horrendous world wars and several perfectly ghastly totalitarianisms. And at the end of the Second World War, uh, it was discovered that the uh, rumors concerning uh, Nazi activity, for example, were, were underestimated. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, it was discovered that the Third Reich had attempted systematically to destroy the Jewish population of Europe and to get rid of all political dissidents. And they had done this uh, by uh, techniques almost too horrible to describe. And so the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials took place. And at those war crimes trials, the Nazi leaders, of course, attempted to defend themselves. And how did they try to do this? They did it by virtue of the philosophy of legal positivism. They said, granted, our legal system is not the same as yours. Granted, our fundamental values are not the same as yours. We simply translated those values into our legal system. Our rule of recognition involved such principles as Aryan supremacy. We did not regard Jews as human beings on the same level as Aryans. Certainly they did not deserve the same rights. And uh, the only reason that we find ourselves in this miserable position is that you won and we lost. On the basis of legal positivism, of course, it's impossible for one legal system to judge another legal system. And the Nazis argued uh, at Nuremberg, among other things, that they therefore did not deserve to be judged by the Allied victors at all. Now this put the prosecution at Nuremberg into a very interesting position. In order for the prosecution to justify uh, the, the criminal uh, prosecution of the Nazi war criminals, it was necessary for them to move beyond legal positivism. They had absolutely no choice. And at Nuremberg, uh, the, the American chief prosecutor uh, was uh, Jackson, the associate justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. And in his summing up, uh, he said this, and I will read this uh, at length because it's very worth listening to on various levels. It is common to think of our own time as standing at the apex of civilization, from which the deficiencies of preceding ages may patronizingly be viewed in the light of what is assumed to be progress. And he puts the word progress in quotation marks. No one put the word progress in quotation marks in the 19th century. 
It was simply assumed that civilization was rising to higher and higher levels and that uh, therefore uh, a cultural millennium was before us and we didn't need to worry about uh, questions such as justifying legal systems. Jackson continues, the reality is that in the long perspective of history, the present century will not hold an admirable position unless its second half is to redeem its first. Well, we're now looking back on the second half of the 20th century, and it surely has not done that. We've discovered, for example, that under Stalin, there was even more evidence of atrocities uh, than under Hitler, for goodness sake. Uh, and then there has been Pol Pot, hasn't there, and Amin Dada, and a whole succession of miserable uh, tyrants uh, who have uh, hurt, maimed, and killed their fellow human beings. These two score years in this 20th century, says Jackson, will be recorded in the Book of Years as one of the most bloody in all annals. Two world wars have left a, a legacy of dead which number more than all the armies engaged in any war that made ancient or medieval history. No half century ever witnessed slaughter on such a scale, such cruelties and inhumanities, such wholesale deportations of peoples into slavery, such annihilations of minorities. The terror of Torquemada pales before the Nazi Inquisition. These deeds are the overshadowing historical facts by which generations to come will remember this decade. If we cannot eliminate the causes and prevent the repetition of these barbaric events, it is not an irresponsible prophecy to say that this 20th century may yet succeed in bringing the doom of civilization. Goaded by these facts, we have moved to redress the blight on the record of our era. At this stage of the proceedings, I rest upon the law of these crimes as laid down in the Charter, the Charter of the International Military Tribunal, uh, the, um, the vehicle by which the war criminals were being judged. In interpreting this Charter, however, says Jackson, we should not overlook the unique and emergent character of this body. It is no part of the constitutional mechanism of internal justice of any of the signatory nations. As an international military tribunal, it rises above the provincial and transient and seeks guidance not only from international law, but also from the basic principles of jurisprudence, which are the assumptions of civilization. What is he saying there? He's saying, agreed, uh, the law being used against the Nazi uh, war criminals is not part of English law, American law, French law, Russian law, not at all. Uh, it takes itself from, uh, the, uh, from the guidance available in international law, but also from the basic principles of jurisprudence, which are, the, which are the assumptions of civilization. What is he saying there? He's saying we've got to go to a law that is higher or deeper than national law. We can't simply rest with the law of a nation because the law of the nation can be damnable, as it was in the case of Nazi jurisprudence. A book was published a year ago in France, Les Lois de Vichy, the Vichy Laws. And in this you have a wonderfully systematic a code, a code modeled on the, the French uh, civil and criminal codes, a beautifully articulated deductive system of law based on Aryan supremacy and modeled on the German laws of the Nazi period. Here, Pétain is simply transferring that kind of thing into uh, a French context. And as a result of this, of course, Jews in France could not hold any public positions, they couldn't be teachers, and they were eventually deported to the death camps just as uh, Jews were throughout Europe. Well, Human rights violations demand a higher law. Human rights violations, in order to be dealt with, require our being able to find some rights that human beings have which must not be taken away by any government, no matter what the government or legal system. But where can we possibly find that sort of thing? Let's say something about that natural law position which existed uh, for centuries and uh, which uh, was moved to the wings uh, by legal positivism. Uh, is the answer to go back to that? Well, 
the essence of natural law theory is that uh, we have built within us uh, an understanding of human value and uh, a, an ethic, a morality, uh, a, a, an understanding of human rights, which we can use to judge positive law. Uh, this approach uh, was uh, first set forth by Aristotle uh, in any material that we're able to, uh, to, to deal with today. And then it was baptized, as it were, by Thomas Aquinas and other medieval theologians uh, and uh, brought within the framework of uh, the medieval West. And it continued on through the Declaration of the Rights of Man at the time of the French Revolution and, of course, the American founding documents. The fundamental idea here is that people really know what's right and they should use that to judge the positive law. Why did that viewpoint disappear? Uh, or at least, uh, why was it supplanted by legal positivism? Well, Bentham, in talking about uh, Blackstone and in criticizing Blackstone, said this whole natural law idea is nonsense on stilts. It's nonsense on stilts, meaning human beings are elevating their own consciences to a high level and they think that those consciences are, are capable of criticizing the law of the land. But how can they prove that their conscience represents anything that is capable of doing such? Bentham had a point. Bentham had a point. One of the biggest difficulties with natural law theory, and one of the reasons that it disappeared from prominence uh, in the 19th century, was the ambiguity and subjectivity of it. Uh, in a way, we might be able, we might characterize that this as the Jiminy Cricket approach to law and human rights. You remember Jiminy Cricket in, uh, in Walt Disney? Jiminy Cricket sings a little song, let your conscience be your guide. Let your conscience be your guide. What's the trouble with this? The trouble with this is, of course, that conscience is culturally conditioned and often culturally determined. When you were a little shaver and you took cookies out of the cookie jar when you shouldn't, mommy came along or daddy and whacked your little hand or your little behind. And as a result of this, you began to feel guilty when you stole cookies. And as a result of this, you stole fewer and fewer cookies. But that's not the only kind of conditioning of conscience possible. Uh, you remember Fagin in Oliver Twist? Remember Fagin? Hmm? Uh, Fagin teaches the street children to, uh, to steal, hmm? to, en to engage in the activity of a cut purse or a pickpocket. And Fagin shows them how to do it, and he makes them feel guilty if they don't bring back valuable watches. So when the kid gets back at the end of the day and he hasn't stolen a good watch, huh, he's blamed for it and he feels guilty and the next day he's going to work harder to steal something of greater value. Conscience is culturally conditioned and therefore it isn't capable of providing this kind of objective standard. It's also, it's also ambiguous. Uh, I'll give you a horrifying example of this. One of the greatest statements of natural law theory appears in the Justinian Code, the great 6th century law code of antiquity. A section of that law code is called the Digest. And at the beginning of the Digest, there is a definition of natural law. And I give it to you uh, in Latin, of course, because this is a university uh, where no one studies driver training, but everybody has a fine classical education. Honesta vivera, alterum non lidera, suum quique Tribura, which translated means to live honestly, to harm no one, and to make sure that each one has what he deserves. Hmm? To live honestly, to harm no one, and to make sure that each person gets what he properly deserves. That's the essence of the natural law. No one would disagree with this, surely. But what exactly does it mean? Shortly after the Second World War, I took uh, friends to the death camp at Buchenwald. Buchenwald, the death camp in the beech forest, that's what Buchenwald means, uh, just outside of the uh, Enlightenment city of Weimar in Germany. 
Uh, the trains had gone very near Weimar, right to the death camp, depositing people, and of course they never came back. And the metal gates leading into Buchenwald have an inscription on them. And this inscription is, uh, in German, Jedem das Zeine. Jedem das Zeine. That means in German, each person gets what he properly deserves. It is the German translation of the third element in the Justinian Code's definition of the natural law. You see what's going on here? The fact of the matter is that the natural law is so vague, so ill-defined, that it can be moved into any context that one wishes, and it can be employed to create hideous injustice because it doesn't define what is meant by what each person properly deserves. It doesn't tell what harm actually consists of, etc. And it certainly doesn't define honesty. Natural law theory uh, may not be as bad as nonsense on stilts, but it certainly isn't going to provide the kind of solid foundation that we need for human rights and for judging inhumanities within legal systems. Where could we go in order to solve this sort of thing? Where could we possibly go? Well, some attempts have been made in recent years to rehabilitate another kind of natural law approach. It isn't called natural law. It actually goes back to the philosopher Kant, Immanuel Kant, in the 18th century. Kant said, you can't prove God's existence or anything theological, but you can prove an ethic. You can establish an ethic that stands beyond any and all argument. He called this ethic uh, the, 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 uh, the ethic uh, of a particular kind of principle. And uh, the principle goes like this. So act that your action can become a universal rule. So act that your action can become a universal rule. He termed this the categorical imperative. It's an imperative, it tells you what you're supposed to be doing, and it's categorical, meaning you can't argue against it. Said Kant, uh, everyone must rationally see the value of this kind of principle. And today there are uh, political scientists and uh, legal theorists who have used that fundamental uh, notion in order to try to justify human rights. Uh, for example, John Rawls, probably the greatest living uh, political theorist in English, John Rawls. Uh, John Rawls says that uh, if you can take hypothetically uh, human beings in a state of ignorance, under the veil of ignorance, so that they don't know anything about their special uh, values or special accomplishments or special uh, merits, if you can take them abstracting away any uh, particular advantages that they have over against others, then they will necessarily have to form governments that embrace uh, his two principles. And these two principles are the following. The first principle. Each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar system of liberty for all. In other words, uh, there, there, there will need to be civil liberties and people will come to those civil liberties if they are uh, removed from any understanding of the special advantages that they have over against others. And the second principle, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged, consistent uh, with uh, what he calls the just savings principle, that is keeping in mind future generations, and attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of equality and opportunity. Now, these two principles come out to be the first and second generation of human rights, as they are termed in uh, contemporary parlance. And in a le lecture at Oxford uh, four years ago, uh, Rawls applied this to human rights. He said, if you take nations and you can abstract 
from them their special advantages. Nations would have to agree to this sort of thing. In other words, nations would have to ratify the civil and political covenant of the United Nations in line with principle number one and the, uh, the economic and social covenant of the United Nations in terms of principle number two. Well, uh, what, what is the problem with this sort of thing? <laughs> problem is simply <laughs> that there's no way that you can get people to forget their special advantages. You can't put them in that kind of, a, uh, of an isolated situation. And there's no point in doing it in theory if in practice they will always operate in terms of their special advantages and privileges. Uh, and, uh, of course, more than that, even if you got individuals and nations to agree that they should always act so that uh, their action could be universalized or generalized, even if you could get them to agree that that's a nice idea, that's no guarantee that they're going to follow it anyway. <laughs> and thirdly, <laughs> the worst of the dictators in human history, those that we've had the worst amount of difficulty with, are not going to agree to that at all because they know their personal power and they are convinced that they can effectively grind down on other people and there isn't any reason why they should stop. Genghis Khan, for example, let's say we have a conversation with Genghis Khan and we try to present a neo kantian ethic to Genghis. We say, Genghis, you've been out raping and pillaging again, haven't you? <laughs> and Genghis says, yes, 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 I have been. And we say, Genghis, Genghis, you have got to operate with a principle of universalization. Genghis, you don't want other people to rape and pillage you, do you? Well, under those circumstances, you surely cannot justify raping and pillaging others. So act that your action can become a universal rule. Genghis, Arrah! Genghis grabs you by the throat and he says, listen, you little pibsqueak. I am Genghis, and I am powerful, and I can rape and pillage, and the others are not going to be able to do this to me. And moreover, I enjoy raping and pillaging. Uh, some people collect stamps. I rape and pillage. And he thereupon inverts you and pounds you into the ground, and the discussion ends. A neo kantian ethic is simply incapable of solving fundamental human rights problems. Well, where could a solution be found? Where could a solution be found? Well, here we need to do a little bit of epistemology, a little bit of work in the philosophical area of truth claims. And uh, probably the best place to start is with Wittgenstein, with Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, the great analytical philosopher of this century. Wittgenstein did a work entitled The Tractatus. It is not good bedtime reading, frankly. It is in uh, numbered propositions and is a very difficult work. But uh, the purpose of this work is to uh, validate, verify, or to determine how you verify propositions. Propositions uh, that are formal in character, factual propositions, and ethical propositions. And when Wittgenstein gets to issues of ethics, he's arrived at Proposition 6.0 and following in this total work, and he concludes very simply, he concludes very simply, it's a three-word proposition. Ethics is transcendental. Ethics is transcendental. What did he mean by this? Well, he explains this in a lecture which was posthumously published, a lecture that he delivered at Oxford. He said, he said, if there really were a book of ethics, which of course would be a book of absolute morality, if there were a book, a true book of ethics, because it's quali qualitatively different, it would be qualitatively different from any other book in the world, it would, as with an explosion, destroy all the other books in the world. What Wittgenstein is saying there is that any ethic arising from the human situation is limited by the human situation. It's culturally conditioned. It can't possibly be absolute because its source isn't absolute. So the only true ethic would be an ethic that doesn't arise from the human situation, an ethic that breaks in from the outside, a transcendental, a transcendent ethic. Now, 
Wittgenstein didn't think there was any such. Uh, my professor of philosophy at Cornell University when I was an undergraduate was Norman Malcolm. Norman Malcolm was a great friend of, of Wittgenstein's and he did a memoir of Wittgenstein. And in this at one point he says, often Wittgenstein would say, oh my God, as if imploring a divine intervention. He didn't think there was any, but he saw perfectly well what the human condition is like without one. Or we can go to Archimedes. Archimedes. The Greek Gazette, the Greek Gazette, nude scientist and bathtub sensation. Hmm? Uh, this Greek Gazette is to help um, uh, teachers of classics to, uh, to interest their students. It's, it, it's the kind of, of, of paper that would have been published if the National Enquirer had been available in the 5th century uh, BC. Um, and of course this refers to Archimedes, refers to Archimedes, uh, because Archimedes uh, one day in lowering himself into his bath, uh, discovered that the amount of water displaced was equivalent to the amount of Archimedes that went into the water. Hmm? Uh, and it, it hit him, it hit him, and he jumped out of the bathtub and ran down the main street of Athens yelling, Eureka, Eureka, I have found it, I have found it. And so, of course, uh, if there had been, um, uh, if the criminal records of that period were still available to us, we would find that he was indicted for indecent exposure in Athens. But our, our interest in Archimedes is on another principle that he set forth. And this is the principle of the lever. The principle of the lever. Said Archimedes, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum outside the world and I can move it. The point being that no matter how great the world is, if you had a lever long enough and a fulcrum properly placed with uh, his little finger, it would have been possible, with his pinky, it would have been possible for Archimedes to move that world. But the condition essential to this is that the fulcrum be outside the world. If the fulcrum is in the world, for goodness sake, you cannot move it. Huh? Uh, this is like trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You will fall on your derriere. It will be painful. It will accomplish nothing. It will be embarrassing. The fulcrum's got to be outside the world in order to move it. Or if you'd like what is really a much simpler illustration of this, water doesn't rise above its own level. Water doesn't rise above its own level. You can't get absolute principles from a non-absolute source. Human beings are finite, human beings are self-centered, and the ethics that they produce are limited by themselves. Or, to quote uh, Thomas Hobbes, human life is nasty, brutish, and short. And from this you are not going to get absolute principles or a standard of human rights which you need under these conditions. The uh, American Founding Fathers talked about inalienable rights. Inalienable rights. What are they? Why, they are rights which cannot be taken away by governments and which the individual cannot even take away from himself or herself. They are inalienable. They cannot be alienated. Where could you possibly get that sort of thing? If human beings create the rights, of course human beings can take away the rights. Epistemologically, the only way you are ever going to be able to get absolute human rights standards is to go outside the human situation to a non-human source. And incredibly, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the 18th century political philosopher, understood this. It is very difficult to find profundity in Rousseau. Uh, in this case, he actually managed it. Um, I don't know if you know much about Rousseau, but he was also an educational theorist. He wrote a work entitled Emile, uh, on, on, it really was the, it was the basis of modern progressive education. And uh, in Emile, uh, the idea was to let the little fellow uh, really do what he wants to. Uh, let him, let him uh, educate himself and his interests will be such that he will not be trammeled by, uh, by the strictures and the rigidity and the legalism of, of a school system. Hmm? Sounds a bit like uh, some American universities, doesn't it? Uh, and, uh, and, and in any case, uh, uh, a nobleman of that period wrote to another nobleman. This is an actual incident. 
and uh, the nobleman said, you know that I've always, always uh, valued the work of Rousseau and that I brought up my son following these principles. My son is now 18 years of age and he's an imbecile. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, we are not at all suggesting uh, that Rousseau is a guide in general <coughs> matters of philosophy, but in the section on law in the social contract, the contrat social, uh, Rousseau says this, in order to discover the rules of society best new suited to nations, a superior intelligence beholding all the passions of men without experiencing any of them would be needed. This intelligence would have to be wholly unrelated to our nature while knowing it through and through. Its happiness would have to be independent of us and yet ready to occupy itself with ours. And lastly, it would, in the march of time, have to look forward to a distant glory and working in one century be able to enjoy in the next. It would take gods to give men laws. It would take gods to give men laws. The point being that in order to get laws that are going to apply under all conditions everywhere, you've got to be able to have a perspective that can see into the human condition past, present, and future. And you've got to be sufficiently independent of the human situation that you're not locked into a particular viewpoint so as to bias the laws that you're setting forth. Thus, it would take gods to give men laws. Well, <clears throat> this, of course, inevitably takes us into the realm of religion. It's in the realm of religion that transcendent claims have been made to deity and to revelation. That is to say, it's religions that have claimed that there is a transcendent source and the transcendent source is spoken. The problem here, of course, is that the religious claims of the world through history have been inconsistent with each other in most instances. Uh, and the religious positions themselves have not often, uh, have, have sometimes not been at all attractive. Uh, for example, um, the Aztec religion. This is, this is one that, uh, that I intend to, uh, to uh, uh, revive, uh, if, if necessary, uh, when I have particular difficulty with my neighbors. Uh, because uh, the, the Aztec uh, solution to the problem of salvation is to uh, uh, sacrifice your neighbor. You, you simply create a pyre and, and you cut him open and uh, burn him. Uh, and instances like this you know, have not encouraged people greatly uh, to look for religious solutions. And there, there are not only the obnoxious solutions like that, but there are solutions uh, which, uh, as a matter of fact, are, are technically meaningless. Uh, philosophers would call them technically meaningless. Uh, for, uh, for example, uh, there is the, uh, the, the claim in Hinduism that Brahman is all. Brahman is all. Now, uh, no one can really dispute this. The problem is, what does it mean? Does it mean that everything is God? If everything is God, then I suppose in a sense nothing is God because it's in this mess that we're trying to get some sort of a solution. Uh, or is this an attempt at definition? If it is an attempt at definition, it doesn't seem to distinguish the transcendent in any way from the imminent. And uh, therefore we find ourselves unable to do very much with it. Uh, if we look at the spread of religions across the centuries, what we really should be looking for is a religion which can demonstrate the truth of its claims. To demonstrate the truth of its claims. Because making claims is easy. There's no trouble in doing this. And uh, surely you living in California understand this. Uh, if people don't like a religion, my heavens, by next weekend they've started their own. And uh, so the, the number of religions per cubic inch, uh, it, it increases constantly. Uh, it, it, it isn't a matter of claiming something, for goodness sake. It's a matter of demonstrating it. And here I have a little illustration that may be helpful to you. Uh, this is also a true story. At the time of the French Revolution, an attempt was made to substitute um, various rational religions, in quotation marks, for historic Christianity. Uh, and one of these attempts, it was a deistic attempt, was um, uh, uh, created by a French philosopher whom you will not know. His name was La Reveillère. 
And La Robelière uh, invented a religion which he called Theanthropie, uh, man is godism. Hmm. And uh, he, did a, uh, he did tracts and booklets and a social program uh, and uh, worked very hard on this. Uh, but it didn't take. And he was very discouraged. So he went to fellow philosophers for advice. And uh, one of the philosophers he went to was, the, was a philosopher that you will know of, that's Talleyrand. Uh, Talleyrand, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, French uh, skeptical philosopher who uh, had a wonderful sense of humor, and uh, Talleyrand said to him, uh, it seems to me that Jesus Christ, in order to found his religion, first died and rose again on the third day. You could at least do that much. <laughs> now, that suggests that there may be a considerable difference among religious positions. Not necessarily in their claims, but in their ability to back them up. Uh, this morning uh, here at the university I uh, gave a talk entitled A Lawyer's Defense of Christianity. And I pointed out in this talk how many distinguished lawyers have become Christians simply on the basis of checking out the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sir Norman Anderson, the head of the School of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London, for example, the greatest authority on Muslim law outside the Muslim world, became a Christian on the basis of the evidence for the resurrection of Christ and wrote a couple of books on that subject. The fact of the matter is that you can go historically into the issue of Christian claims and you find that these are solidly grounded in empirical observational fact and that they lead you in only one direction. The direction is to Jesus as not, not a, 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 a Jewish boy scout helping little old ladies across the Sea of Galilee, uh, but a person who claimed to be no less than God Almighty come to earth to die for the sins of the world. And he rose again from the dead in order to demonstrate the truth of those affirmations. And he put a stamp of approval on the Bible. He put his good housekeeping stamp of approval on the Bible. Hmm? His <coughs> imprimatur nihil obstat. And as a result of this, the Christian claim is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, hmm? providing a specific revelation of principles which are inalienable. These principles hold under all circumstances owing to the fact that they do not derive from human source at all. They derive from the transcendent. They fulfill Wittgenstein's description of uh, the book which with an explosion would destroy all the other books in the world. Now this is a perfectly staggering kind of claim but it's a claim that is backed up on the basis of specific historical evidence. Um, in Boston, I gave a paper two weeks ago dealing with um, a topic which sounds a bit like a California topic. It has to do with Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in the New Testament. I mean, Californians just love prophecy. You've got people going around prophesying all over the place. But uh, what I was talking about was not contemporary prophecy. I was talking about Old Testament specific prophecies dealing with the coming of the Messiah. And I used the product rule in statistics on this. If only 25 of these prophecies came out correctly, and they are independent, so you can use the, the product rule with very little difficulty, then the probabilities against all 25 coming out in the case of Jesus you know, will be calculated on the basis of the formula, uh, if the chances of any one of them is only 25%, 1 over 4 raised to the 25th power. Hmm, the product rule. And that means that the chances against this coming out by chance is one in a thousand trillion. One in a thousand trillion. Now, statistics don't establish cause and effect, obviously, uh, but what are you going to do with a situation like this? The Old Testament was written before the New, so it, this can't be a situation of the prophecies being written after their fulfillments, and there's no way that the life of Christ could have been fudged to make it fit the prophecies because the records of that life were in circulation while hostile religious witnesses were still alive who would have blown the whistle on it. My goodness, the Jewish religious leaders uh, knew their Old Testaments and if Jesus had been born not in Bethlehem but in Detroit they would have been the first to raise an objection to all of this. 
What we've got is a combination of powerful, powerful prophetic evidence and solid resurrection evidence that Jesus was the very person he claimed to be. Now, if this turns out to be the case, notice what you get in the human rights realm. You get, first of all, that book that Wittgenstein talked about. You get the principles, and you don't get them in the vague sense of natural law. You get highly specific principles, not just the Ten Commandments, but the principles that are running all the way through Scripture. Uh, in my book, Human Rights and Human Dignity, I've correlated these principles to various human rights conventions today. They are highly specific, and they give a transcendent basis for the principles. But you get more than that. You get something, if possible, more important than the principles. We began by pointing out that everybody's in favor of human rights. The most greasy dictators are always saying nice things about human rights. Meanwhile, they're boiling someone else in oil. What does this say? It says that the real problem of human rights is something beyond the question of the principles. It's the motivation to follow the principles. It's the motivation to follow the principles. Genghis may very well know that it's not nice to go out and rape and pillage, but he enjoys it, right? The fact of the matter is that the human race is self-centered, and therefore nations are self-centered, and therefore they skew human rights in their own direction to protect themselves, and they don't worry about the next person, les uns et les autres. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in the area of human rights, what is really needed is some device by which human rights can be interiorized, made a part of the human being, so the human being really wants to treat the other person decently. Now, no human rights philosophy other than the gospel of Jesus Christ can change people's hearts. And unless and until the hearts are changed, you can plaster proper human rights principles on every, law, every wall everywhere, huh? and you will not get results appreciably different from the current ones. As somebody has said, what we what we need is not more good advice. What we need is good news. Amen. We... <laughs> he said this morning that we didn't look alive in Southern California. And, and, alive you, and, and you wanted to prove that you did. And, and you know, I really appreciate that. I was hoping that there'd be a Baptist here. <laughs> in any case, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Christian message makes it possible not only to know what the principles are and to ground these principles transcendentally, huh? it makes it possible for you and me, individuals, to get changed inside. And, and how does this happen? Well, you know, a, a physician can't force a medicine down someone's gullet if the person doesn't believe he has a disease. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> that happens to be <clears throat> a tort against the person in law. Uh, you, you can't do that. The person has got to recognize he's sick, for heaven's sake, before he's going to take the medicine. So the first step in this thing is to recognize just how radically self-centered we are. And if we see this, then the question is, what's to be done about it? Well, you can't pull yourself up to heaven by your own bootstraps any more than it's possible to <laughs> make the world rise when the fulcrum is on it. You need help from outside. You need a fulcrum outside. And that's exactly the point of Jesus coming to earth. He came to earth to die for you on the cross, to take the punishment you deserved on him, and to expiate it and make it possible for you to enter into his presence forever. And that, if you believe this, if you'll enter into a relationship with him on that basis, then he comes into your heart by way of the Holy Spirit, and your life has changed. Your life has changed. Uh, New Testament, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And those who have entered into this demonstrate this within their own uh, selves and understand it within themselves. They are not engaged in some kind of interior religiosity, working themselves up into a mystic experience of some sort. It isn't that at all. This is grounded solidly in the evidence that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. The objective evidence of the resurrection of Christ, the solidity of the scriptures, they offer the basis for entering into that relationship. And when people do that, you know, they really are more interested in other people than they are in themselves. 
They really do go along with Augustine's principle, love God and do as you please. Because if you love God, what you want to do is what pleases Him. And the scriptures tell you what, tell you what pleases Him, and that's exactly the basis that we need for a solid understanding of human rights. All right, I thank you very much, and we're open to questions.